Scale Up Nation, I get people asking me all the time, how do I read so much as busy as I am? And the secret is, a lot of my reading people do for me. That's right, I use Audible. Audible is a service that will read books to you and allow you to get the content while you're driving from account to account. I've been using Audible for years and you can try it for free, one book and one month for free on me through our affiliate link, scalinguph2o.com forward slash Audible. Welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. My name is Trace Blackmore. I get to host the Scaling Up H2O podcast, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Nation, today we're going to be talking about something that we all do. Some of us may not like to admit it that we do it. Maybe we even keep it secret from some people. We don't want to be accused of doing it. What exactly is it that I'm talking about? talking about selling. For some reason, selling has such a negative connotation to so many people. And I'm willing to bet it's because of a situation that you've had in your life where you were treated a certain way, and you just did not like being treated that way. And that's how you equate selling. Well, Nation, whether you like it or not, we are all involved with selling. Anytime you're trying to convey a message that ultimately results in somebody doing something, that's selling. Maybe it's selling to get your kids to go to bed. Maybe it's selling that you want to buy something and your significant other does not think you need to buy it. Whatever it is, Just look at all the things in our lives that are really sales, and we don't need to put that negative image in whatever that is. We just have that in there. And some of us don't have that in there. I love that I am a salesperson. I think it's great that I get to connect others with a potential solution that I can offer for them. I love being able to do that, and that's what I consider sales. Well, today we are interviewing somebody that we're going to talk all about this, and we're going to try to redefine how you define what sales is. So Nation, I know you are going to enjoy this interview. My lab partner today is Bob Davis of Wilson Learning. Bob, welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Thank you very much, Trace. Bob, you had uh, the pleasure of having me in your class. No, it was my pleasure having you instruct me on some techniques on how we can learn styles of people differently so we could better fulfill what their needs were, learn what their issues were, and then figure out what those solutions are. I truly enjoyed that class, and I just jumped at the chance to bring you on this podcast so I could share with the Scaling Up Nation all the great things that I learned during your class. And I know we're going to be talking a little bit about what we did in our class, but uh, some more in some general things that we need to talk about when it comes to the topic of sales. But before we get there, I want to ask you, who is Bob Davis? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, let me start when I got out of school. I immediately spent a year at Rikers Island Prison in New York City. I worked there, just to be clear, and from there, spent a couple of years in social services, working with mentally challenged kids and emotionally disturbed kids, and from there, developed a career in sales. And interestingly enough, I always tell people that background, that three-year background working in social services actually helped me tremendously when I got into selling. Because social services, you're working with counseling people and you're talking to them about what they want to accomplish and helping them move places they may not have thought that they wanted to move or were able to move to. And in many ways, selling is about that. So in my role as a salesperson, I've sold capital equipment, I've sold consumables, and I've sold services 
primarily in the healthcare field, and then joined Wilson Learning about two decades ago, where what I do with Wilson Learning is a combination of both account management and I also do facilitation of selected training programs, such as the one that you went through recently. And Bob, I have to say, you had the best mix of learning, lecturing, and getting together in breakout rooms and and having activities. A lot of times, classes that I've attended, seminars that I've attended, there's not a good balance or the breakout rooms are just a a total mess and you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm just not getting anything out of this. But everything built on each other. I thoroughly enjoyed those two days. Well, you know, it was interesting. It was a real challenge for me, frankly, switching to virtual training from live classroom, because frankly, I feed on the reaction of my audience. And you get so much of that in a live session. And in fact, I actually do a lot of global and national sales meetings and have worked with groups as large as 500 people. So it was a real stretch for me to do that. But after some experimentation, I think I finally cracked the code on how do you make virtual training as good as live training. And I appreciate that feedback from the recent session you went through. And that session was made up of all water treaters, a lot of mastermind members. How difficult was it for you to learn enough about our industry to present it as well as you did? You know, it's an interesting question because I've worked with so many differing industries over a quarter of a century. I mean, I've got background in everything from water treatment to medical device to insurance to banking. I've worked so much in all of those industries. So it really helps me come to sessions like that one with some background already in what's water treatment all about. For example, you know, I did a project years back with the U.S. Filter, which is now Siemens. So I learned a lot about water treatment when I was working with them. So I come to the party already knowing a lot about most industries that I wind up working with. The topic that most of us think that we're going to be talking about today is sales, but we're going to elevate that a little bit. We're going to talk about negotiation. Let's start right out of the gate. What's the difference between sales and negotiation? You know, in many ways, they're very similar. They really are. But here's the significant difference. Selling is about what you do to build value throughout the communication process with the customer. Negotiation is what you do at the end of the sales process. But what I maintain is that you are negotiating even during the sales process. You're not negotiating for a deal. Most people think negotiation is I'm in a walnut encrusted room with very important people dealing with terms, conditions, final pricing, the contract. And William Urey, the co author of the book Getting to Yes, once said, if you wait to negotiate until you're negotiating, it's too late. Because people don't realize that I'm negotiating the very first minute I meet a new customer. I'm not negotiating for a deal, for a price. I'm negotiating for things like access to other people. I'm negotiating for a plant tour. I am negotiating to get access to information. I am constantly negotiating And it is integrated with selling. That's the big learning I have found when I teach negotiating is people say, you know, I always thought of it as here's what happens when we're sitting down at that final table with the contract in front of us. So how would you describe the quintessential negotiator? The quintessential negotiator is constantly looking to add value to their customer. They are looking to understand not only the positions that a customer has, but the interest behind those positions. The key skill in negotiating is taking the position, I want a lower price. I don't want that term and condition in the contract. And understanding why that person does not want that term and condition. Or understanding why that price is giving the other party such angst. There's a huge difference between 
what somebody wants and what they need. And when I talk about negotiating with salespeople, I am telling them that the best negotiating trainer in human history once said this, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you get what you need. Many people don't realize that person was a great negotiating commentator, but he is. And that's one of the key differentiators between the good negotiators and the not so good negotiators. When we talk about sales or a salesperson, I think everybody conjures the image of a used car salesman. How do we get past that? And by having the mindset that we're now a negotiator, does that get us past that? Not necessarily. The reason we think that, and when I've done training programs in the past, I often ask this question. I say to a group, what's the first word that comes to mind when I say this word? Word association test. And the word I toss out at the people I'm training is this, salesperson. Well, guess what kind of first words come to mind? Not trusted advisor, not honorable person, but words like sleaze, cheat. I mean, these are terrible words to be out there connected to salesperson. And here's what's really interesting. I do this in an audience filled with salespeople. Yeah, you did it with us. Right. And these people should be thinking about themselves, but they're not. What they're thinking about is the kind of experiences they've had when they've worked with salespeople. And most of us, our experience with salespeople, frankly, is not that good. At best, it's neutral. I went in the store, they packaged the shirt properly, they rang up my credit card, but I did not feel like I had a stunning experience where that person was focused on me in a way that was memorable. Our memories of great buying experiences are few and far between. So how do we change that perception? What is something that I as a salesperson, I as a negotiator that I hope to be, what is something that I can do that changes the person I'm communicating with perception of the situation? The biggest mistake salespeople make is they too quickly start talking about their stuff as opposed to understanding that their job in a sales interaction is to get the customer to articulate their vision of value. That is the most significant thing. And how they do that is by having what I call an issues-based dialogue with a customer rather than a product or service-based dialogue with a customer. In other words, my focus needs to be on understanding what's going on with that customer. So for example, when I start my interview with a customer that I've not met in the past, I always start it this way. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself, my company, and what we do. But more importantly, and that key phrase is important, but more importantly, what I really want to do today is find out about you, your challenges, and the opportunities you're looking at, and why you've even entertained having a conversation with me about my product. What's driving your interest in using our product and potentially considering us as a resource? I think we need to, right from the get-go, that first sentence out of our mouths needs to be customer-centric and signals the rules of engagement with that customer are this. I am here to find out what's going on with you so that we can decide together if what I have to offer may be useful to you. How important is role play in learning new techniques? I would say it's extremely important. And role playing is something that you don't have to do in a classroom. I mean, you frequently will go to calls with a manager, for example, or with a support person that's working for your company, who's maybe an SME in some technical aspect of your water treatment or whatever you're selling. Why not in the car on the way there say, hey, you play the customer, I'll play the salesperson, and you be as tough on me as you can. 
I want you to raise the toughest questions you can think that you might have about me, my company, and my product. Bob, it's always surprised me at how many people don't take advantage of that. Is that just been my experience, or do you see that as well? People aren't practicing by role playing. People aren't practicing, period. And you join the rest of the crowd in America. What's, what's amazing to me is how people don't practice. And, you know, I often say when I'm doing my training, I reference Ted Williams. Ted Williams, the best hitter in baseball history. His batting average, life, well, not lifetime, his best year was 401. Well, let's round. 400. What does that mean? He missed 60% of the time. But why was he the best player in baseball history? The best hitter, I should say. Here's why. You read his biography, he practiced. He practiced constantly, not just when he was in front of the ball. He would have a hairbrush in his hand, brushing his hair. And anything that was in his hand, he would take and hold it like it was a bat and practice swinging the hairbrush and asking himself, when should I break my wrist to optimize this? Practice, practice, practice. Trace, it's like the old joke about the person who was lost in New York City, walked up to someone and said, excuse me, sir, but how do I get to Carnegie Hall? The answer to that corny old joke was this. Practice, practice, practice. There you go. And that's how you get good at negotiating. That's how you get good at selling. A friend of mine is a trial attorney, and they often do mock trials. And I've actually experienced, I'm one of the participants uh, in one of the mock trials. And it was just amazing how practiced they were before they would speak to a jury. And they would throw different curveballs at each other. So by the time my friend actually was speaking in the courtroom, he heard things that were far worse than what was actually being thrown at him. And I was, at that point on, I knew that practicing via role play on every situation when you're going out and talk to a customer, obviously we're not going to take it to that extreme, but it was just amazing to watch that. If somebody is listening today and they've never practiced sales before, they've never done role play before. You mentioned, you know, get with somebody in the car. What if they're by themselves? How can they practice by themselves? I think when you're by yourself, it's obviously not, not easy to role play with yourself. You will right. typically be successful when you do that. But here's my thought on getting some practice with yourself. Think about the toughest questions that a customer might ask you. Write them down. The very hardest questions. Why is your product 20% more than everybody else's? Why should I trust you when you're a small company when there are other much larger companies that I could potentially work with? Why should I shift from the existing company that I work with? You know, there's a story I tell about a gentleman by the name of Ben Duffy who won a big piece of business because he did just that. Ben Duffy was working with a major American company. His first call, his call was on the person of the company. He sat in his hotel and wrote down the toughest questions he thought that person might ask him, brought those questions to the call the next day, and was therefore prepared for those tough questions. He didn't have a chance to role play with anybody. He just wrote them down the night before. And by the way, when you start imagining the very toughest questions, likely not all of them will come up, but you are at least prepared by imagining the hardest, most horrific, the toughest question that someone might ask you. And by imagining the toughest one, you know, you're prepared for things that might even be not quite as tough. As Mark Twain once said, my life has been filled with many tragedies most of which never happened. So imagine the toughest thing that could come up in that meeting, and you will indeed be prepared. Well, let's talk as a negotiator now. Let's say somebody did ask the question you just brought up, your price is too high. 
what should have a negotiator been doing up to that point and how should a negotiator handle that question or, or objection, I should say? Yeah. And there's really two separate questions there. One is what should they have done up to that point to prevent that? Number one, let's go there to prevent it and then what to do if it comes up, because it will come up even if you do everything right. That's the reality of, of life. What you should be doing to keep it from happening is focus the conversation on the customer and what value looks like from their perspective. By getting the customer to articulate their vision of value, you are less likely to have the price objection come up. In fact, I maintain that most salespeople actually cause the price objection. You want to know why? Please. Because they bring up their product too soon. And if I bring up the product, needless to say, the first question I'm going to ask is, wow, why is it so expensive? And in fact, most salespeople think that my job is to tell the customer about all the value adds that my product brings. So I tell you about 10 reasons people use our product, 10 things we baked into it that are value add. Customer looks at that and says, well, gosh, I like five of those, but five of them are of zero interest to me. You know what you've just done? You have convinced the customer why your product is more expensive because someone's paying for those five other things and it's me. That's who's paying for it. So you've told them why your product is more expensive or convinced them that your product is more expensive. Now, the second part of your question, which is what do I do when it does come up? Here's my go-to answer, and it's called performing negotiation jujitsu. Negotiation jujitsu means I actually use the energy of the other party to bring the conversation where I would like it to be. So I have two responses to that. So Trace, play the customer. Say, gosh, Bob, your product's way too expensive. Bob, I love what I hear, but your product is way too expensive. Thank you for that. Let me write that down. What else? And so what I've just done is I've told you I heard what you said, and I wrote it down. And in fact, when I write it down, I actually smile at the customer as I'm writing it down. But then I say, what else is really important as you think about the potential of acquiring our product or service. So I've told them I've heard them, but I'm saying I want to hear other things too. That's one approach. Here's the second approach. Let's try it one more time because you're pretty good at role-playing a difficult customer. <laughs> I've had my experience with them. I'll bet you have. I'll bet you have. So let's do it one more time. Bob, it sounds great, but your price is way too high. So Trace, if I understand you right, it sounds like this is a dollar and cents issue. Would that be correct, Trace? Well, Bob, you explained 10 things that your product does. Honestly, I'm only interested in five of them, and I don't have the budget to pay for the other five. Well, let me go back now. I would never do that. I would never have explained <laughs> those five things. So you're talking to the wrong salesperson. But let's reset this. <laughs> and, I, and by the way, that is indeed exactly what would happen if someone didn't do what I suggested earlier. But let's assume I didn't do that. So now back to role play. Your price is too high, Bob. I was told I had a certain budget, and we are not going to be able to make that budget with the number you just gave me. Gotcha. So the real problem in your case is budget. It's not really dollars and cents. It's total dollars and cents. It's really budget. Is that correct? It is that. And if I go over that amount, I cannot handle this decision. It then goes to another committee. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that with me. Well, let's address budget and let's now address dollars and cents, because if you did sign off on this, you've got some explaining to do, right? Absolutely. So let's talk about dollars and cents and how dollars and cents gets impacted by what I'm offering you. So let's stop the role play now. Now, what I just did, two things. I want to shift the conversation to dollars and cents because I may talking to one of the people who attended your last class. He talked about how he sells a piece of capital equipment that doesn't break as often as the competitors. So now he's able to talk to that company about dollars and cents. Let's talk about what it costs you for downtime when this other product breaks. Even though the customer said to them, 
that their service team is great. They're in here in a flash every time something goes wrong. Well, that's great. But when they get there, still, how long is your system down and you can't produce? So I try to shift the discussion and dig down into what else is going on. And in fact, I wouldn't hesitate. If this is going to another committee, I would welcome that because as long, assuming you've been a cooperative customer with, with me, I'd want to find out what's really important, what other value this product brings so that I can help you build a victory speech. Bill Yuri in his book, Getting Past No, which is another great book on negotiating that he's written, he talks about how do I build a golden bridge for the person that I'm negotiating with? In other words, how do I give you something that you can go to that other party with, that other committee with, that has you looking good? He says, how do I help Trace build a victory speech? And if Trace is a cooperative customer and he really does want my stuff, but he's limited by budget and knowing that there's other people involved, I'm helping Trace build that golden bridge for himself and build a victory speech. Read Yuri's book. Yuri's stuff is great. He's from the Harvard program on negotiating. And when I talk to people about negotiating, that's the methodology that I'm talking about. Bob, the reason I brought up the word committee is I think old sales training, the old training that we all had was it was you and your customer. But now decisions don't get made that way. They might get influenced by one person, but there might be a dozen people that have to sign off on something. What should we be doing to make sure we're handling the objections of every person, knowing that maybe the most influential person in the room is never saying a word? A couple of things. Number one, and in negotiating, when I'm teaching negotiating, we talk to people about the importance of early as possible, build a stakeholder map. Find out who the stakeholders are. And here is the worst question to ask to identify that. Never ask, are you the decision maker? You just devalued everybody else in the room. My goodness, you you certainly have. And you know what? Every time I've asked that of someone in the past before I knew better than to ask that, someone would say, of course I am. I never had anybody say, Gee, Bob, I am a low-paid lackey around here. No one pays any attention to me. That's never the answer I get. It's always, yes, I'm the decision maker. I have a much better question that will help you identify the stakeholders, and it's this. Walk me through the process you envision as you acquire this capital equipment, as you acquire this new water treatment process that we're discussing here. So what I've done with that question is I've taken it from a people question and made it a process question. And that is a question that is not about power and influence. And people tend to want to answer that question. They'll say things like, you know, uh, well, first of all, myself and Jim, you know, we're basically vetting the various vendors that have solutions in that area. Terrific. So it's you and Jim first. And and then what happens after you've vetted, you've got a skinny list of the people that are acceptable. Well, then it goes to our CFO. So he runs the numbers that I asked those vendors we've selected to give us some financial figures. And then what? And then if it passed that muster, then the president of our organization gives the final stamp of approval. I just got all the decision, the real decision maker is the president and a strong decision influencer is the CFO. One of the biggest mistakes people make when negotiating is this and selling as well. They confuse a strong influencer with the decision maker. And never mind the decision maker might even be in that room and not say much. The decision maker may not even be visible to you. And everybody in selling has had this experience. I thought I had the deal sewed up. In fact, I forecasted it for Q4. And then I went back to my customer who's been helpful in working with me. And the customer said, I'm really sorry, but Jim Smith said, we're going in another direction. Well, who the heck is Jim Smith? That was the decision maker that I didn't find out because I didn't build a process map of how they envision themselves making a decision. Bob, is there any way to salvage that once you get that information? 
that Jim Smith has now decided to go someplace else. Maybe he hasn't quite put ink to paper. Is there any way you can still salvage that deal? Do you have any technique with that? Uh, yeah, drugs and therapy could help you at that point. <laughs> right. um, I, I think, frankly, once you've reached that point, it's it's often totally lost. But it doesn't mean you have to immediately cave and walk out like a dog with a tail between its legs. You can certainly just start asking a few more questions. Well, fill me in on Jim Smith's thinking on this. What's going on with him? Maybe then I can get some clues that could help me re-engage with Jim Smith. Now, if this person has trusted me, if I've done my work and built trust, I might be able to ask this person, you know, I, I realize that you're going in that direction, but I would welcome having a brief meeting with, with Jim Smith because we've spent so much time together. And if you've earned that person's trust, you may earn the right to do that. But quite frankly, the drugs and therapy route might be the only thing left for you. Whenever you're in sales, uh, hopefully we're all thinking that we're not salespeople now. We are negotiators. We're having that mindset. We're having those conversations with our customers. What are some of the things, what are some of the metrics that we should be monitoring? A couple of things. And this, you know, the metric that most often gets measured in sales and by sales managers is the sale. Here's the problem. That's looking backwards. Because if my sales are down, I should have been let go or counseled or coached three to six months ago. It's too late to fix things. The kind of metrics that we and our sales managers should be looking at are things like how much time are customers willing to spend with me? Another metric, did I have a call that was focused on issues, challenges, and opportunities that this customer is facing? And how you can measure that metric is this. Could I sit down and write an email to the customer summarizing our meeting? And that summary is more about the customer, not about my product. That whole summary is about here's the issues you're facing. You're concerned about safety in the water that's in your hotel. You're concerned about how much time it's taking for people to do the various testing. You're concerned about the exposure of your staff to chemicals that are being utilized right now in your water safety. I want my email to all be listing those kinds of things rather than anything about my product. So I can conclude the email by saying, you shared a number of things that will help me put together a draft on the ways I think we can be of help to you. Let me know I caught it all, and I'd like to stop in next week with some draft ideas on how we might begin working together. Bob, whenever we have a process that we can follow, things just get easier because we can visually see that. What should our process be as a negotiator? I think it's, it's simple. It's threefold. And the way to learn this process best is go to Amazon, look up books by William Urey, U-R-Y. The process that came out of Harvard many years ago and has been amplified and enhanced by William Urey is the process to follow. And, and it's three simple steps. The first thing is I deal with people issues. And within that, the specific strategy is stepping to the side of the other party and doing that as early and as frequently as you can. It does not mean agreeing with everything they say. It means validating their thinking and or feelings and showing them that the real interest you have is understanding them. This is why one of the things I said earlier was I start meetings by saying, I'm here to tell you a little bit about myself, but more importantly, I want to find out about what's driving your need to consider a change in your water chemistry uh, protocol at XYZ Company. But more importantly is a key word. I am stepping to their side by doing that. That's step one, dealing with people issues. Step two is exploring issues. How do I get really good 
at asking penetrating questions that help the customer articulate their vision of value. And the questions are not about product. I'm not asking them, tell me about the products you're using right now. You do need to know that. Tell me about the machine you're using, the capital equipment you're using. I want to really find out what are their issues. Tell me what concerns you have around water safety. Tell me about the issues you're concerned with regarding your staff's exposure to the chemicals that they're currently using in in your process. I want it to be about them. And when I'm exploring issues, I always get at interests behind positions. It's not what somebody wants. It's why they want it. It's like the story about the two kids that were fighting over the last orange in the fridge. Mom comes into the kitchen or dad comes into the kitchen and they're fighting. It's the last orange. What's a good parent to do? Well, most people, when I ask this question, when I train negotiating, say, well, split the orange. Well, guess what? One kid is going to be upset. I got more seeds in mind. Wait, she got a bigger half or he got a bigger half. If that mom had or dad had only asked, why do you want the orange? They would have found out that one child wanted it because it's hot out and I want this nice cold orange juice. It's been in the fridge all day. If she said to the other child, why do you want it? Well, I just finished a home economics class on the internet with my school and they talked about making orange frosting and you use this thing called orange zest. And so I want to make that frosting. I'd love to make some cupcakes today. If that parent knew that, both of them could have had exactly what they wanted. 100% of the pulp goes to one child. 100% of the orange rind goes to the other child. The mistake we make is not asking those questions to understand what's behind it. Instead, we're taught to overcome objections. As soon as there's an objection, we give a snappy answer. And you know what happens when we do that? We get a second objection. And it, and it looks like you're playing ping pong with the customer with objections going back and forth. So exploring issues is, is critical. And you can read more about that in Yuri's books. Finally, how do I now present an offer that cannot be refused? That only happens because you've done all of the things preceding it. As Yuri said so famously, if you wait to negotiate until you're negotiating, it's too late. You haven't discovered the interest behind positions, and that's why you are not delivering options that are truly for mutual gain between you and the other party. Bob, tell us a little bit about some of the classes that you personally teach. Uh, Classes I teach... I stick to my knitting, and I just teach three particular classes. Uh, Negotiating is one of them. And interestingly enough, I am finding that there is many more of my clients asking for that as a class. Second class is counselor salesperson, consultative selling. Everybody wants to know, how do I sell consultatively? How do I become a trusted advisor in the customer's mind? How do I collapse the sales cycle? That's what, we, that's what gets talked about in that program. And lastly, something called versatile salesperson, and that's the class you went through. It's really about how do I adapt myself to people that are different than me? How do I understand the differences in human beings and understand that someone is not being difficult necessarily? They're just being how they wound up landed on the planet. And I need to understand those differences so that I can withhold judgment and I can work with that person. If I happen to be something that, um, you know, some of your audience may be familiar with this term, if I'm an amiable, I'm concerned about how's everybody feeling. I'm concerned about feelings. I'm concerned about people. I need to learn to work with the drivers, the people that are bottom line oriented, that don't want to know about my dog Fluffy and how my weekend was. They just care about the work to be done. End of story. Well, I need to understand if I'm an amiable, that that person is not being mean. That person is simply being how they are. And guess what? When you get the work done with the driver, then they will play. So drivers work first, play second, 
amiables like to play first, work second. And I need to understand that so that I can flip what I do when I meet someone who's an opposite style from myself. That, in a nutshell, describes that program. Bob, if somebody is listening today and one or all of those courses really intrigue them, how can they find out more information? Uh, just get in touch with me. I work for an agency of Wilson Learning. And so um, they would just contact me at bdavis at newview.com. Let me spell newview because it's different. N U V U E newview.com. And that will get to me. And I'm more than happy to talk to any of your listeners. I'll make sure to have that contact information on our show notes page. Bob, not quite done with you yet. I've got some lightning round questions. So are you buckled in? Are you ready? I'm ready. My first question, if you had the ability to go back in time and talk to your former self on your first day as a negotiator, what advice would you give? Stop telling people about your product. Focus on why they want your product. Who plays Bob in a movie? Tom Hanks. I love that answer. Last question. If you could talk with anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? Probably Jesus Christ. And I say this, believe it or not, partly from a spiritual sense, but he did an outstanding job of selling, if you will, by asking questions. He answered a question with a question. You know, whose face is on this coin when people ask him about money? Well, then render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. He understood how to get the other person to articulate their vision of value. That's an amazing answer. Bob, this has been so much fun. I have no doubt we could probably have this conversation for another hour. So be on the lookout for me inviting you back for a follow-up episode. But I just want to thank you for coming on Scaling Up H2O. Well, it's a pleasure being here, and I trust that some of the ideas we've shared have been uh, useful and added value to the people you serve. Bob, thanks again for coming on Scaling Up H2O. A couple of months ago, I had the privilege to attend one of Bob's seminars with several of the Rising Tide Mastermind members, and we just had a lot of fun. He is a really good facilitator and also instructor. Uh, he had probably the best balance ever that I've experienced of group work to lecture to self work. It just seemed to move very well. So very well done, Bob. I really enjoyed it. And I would recommend for anybody who's listening, if you want to take a sales class from Bob, you will not be let down. More information on that is on my show notes page. Nation, I've got a couple of phone calls where people want to know where the heck is the continuation of episode 237? You left us hanging on that pinks and blues on how to clean a cooling tower. Well, Nation, don't worry. That's coming up next week. We decided to split the pinks and blues up a little bit. So hopefully the anticipation is worth it. If you have not listened to episode 237, I would highly recommend that you listen to that before episode 240 that comes out next week. And before we have episode 240 coming out next week, we still have one item of business left. And that, of course, is with the help of our friend James McDonald. Here is a brand new Thinking on Water with James. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James, the segment where we don't give you the answers, we give you the topics and questions for you to think about, drop by drop. Now let's get to it. In this week's episode, we're thinking about how pressure and temperature affect the flux rate of water through a reverse osmosis membrane. As the makeup water temperature increases, how does this impact how much water can get through an RO membrane? Does it increase or decrease or remain unchanged? Similarly, how can an increasing RO feed pressure impact how much water gets through the membrane? 
How do these two changing parameters affect the overall performance of the RO? How can they muddy the waters, so to speak, when trying to judge changes in RO performance to determine when it's time to clean the membranes? How do they impact the rate of dissolved solids making it through the membrane? Take this week to think about the impact of pressure and temperature on RO membrane performance. Be sure to follow hashtag TOW22 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O to share your thoughts on each week's Thinking on Water. I'm James McDonald, and I look forward to learning more from you. Scaling Up Nation, if you have not caught up to all of the Thinking on Water with James, it's not too late. In fact, we have an entire archive on our show notes page. You can simply go back to previous episodes and listen to all of those. Not hard to catch up at all. And of course, the more we think on water, the more we are going to do with water, the better we are going to become treating water, and the circle just keeps growing bigger and bigger. James, thanks again for putting all the time in that you do with that and making us just a little bit better each and every day. Nation, as mentioned, you will have that continuation episode next week, episode 240, where we're going to be continuing that Scaling Up Nation members question about cleaning cooling towers. Until then, I hope you have a fun and safe week. Go out there and sell something. Take care of each other. Have a great week, folks. The one way that the mastermind has helped me approach my leadership differently is I like to see different people's perspectives. If I have a question about what should I do about a situation or how I should kind of, I guess, captain my ship, it's really nice to see different people's perspectives. And the in the middle, which is where a designated person every week brings an issue to the group where we discuss it and give advice, you know, seeing the in the middle of myself and my fellow group mates has really helped me answer any, you know, leadership questions I have, really given me some, you know, tough things to think about. And it's just kind of helped me maintain best practices or at least reaffirm that I'm on the right track. When we worked on traction and looked into EOS, that's definitely something that I'd like to do for our leadership in the future. And it's really given me an understanding where I feel like I can take that and move forward. To find out more, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.